Hello and welcome to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. Thanks for joining us. I'm Malcolm Borthwick, Editor of Intellectual Capital at Bailey Gifford. The investment industry is awash with talk of environmental, social and governance or ESG issues, and other terms such as stewardship, impact and responsible investing. The danger is, is that we end up with a form of ESG reductionism, where the subject is reduced to simplistic metrics and soundbites. So how should we navigate these complex and uncertain issues? I'm joined by Stuart Dunbar, who's a partner at Bailey Gifford. But before we start the conversation, some important information. Please remember that as with all investments, your capital is at risk and your income is not guaranteed. Stuart, welcome back to Short Briefings on Long-Term Thinking. We spoke about a year ago in this podcast about actual investing and what we at Bailey Gifford mean by this. And you've just written a follow-up paper to this about actual ESG. Let's start by talking about what we mean by ESG. How would you define it? So ESG is widely accepted as meaning environmental, social and governance issues. Obviously, that means how you operate your company, how your company impacts society and how your company impacts the environment. And it's become a bit of a catch-all for thinking longer term and specifically looking at these issues in the context of making investment decisions. I think it's helpful. There are loads of other terms, responsible investing, impact investing, all sorts of variations on a theme. But ESG probably does capture these types of issues. One rather nice phrase I did hear a colleague using for us recently is that ESG should actually stand for exploring sustainable growth. Now, that may not apply to every company, but I think that might be quite a nice way of thinking about what what we're trying to do at Bailey Gifford. And how do we look at ESG at Bailey Gifford? I think it's resource-intensive, complex, system-wide consideration. Now, that may sit uneasily alongside the fact that we talk about all our investment decisions are made at company level, but I, I think the two are not inconsistent. The reason for that is in in the paper I talked about the great difficulty of marrying the top-down view of ESG with the bottom-up company view of ESG. And the challenge there is that what looks right to an individual investor, as in, you know, don't invest in miners or something because they scar the landscape, very much doesn't look right from the perspective of are we meaningfully investing in a way to facilitate a carbon transition, for example. We are very wedded to the idea of disruption and growth. The types of companies that we look for, regardless of ESG factors, are those that are finding newer and better and more efficient ways of satisfying the needs of people. And the growing focus on ESG factors, and E in particular, I think is where we're going to find many of those disruptive opportunities and and some of the very best growth opportunities for the next 20, 30 years are going to be those companies that are able to go through this carbon transition in a positive way for finding solutions to to answers, not just avoiding the problem by, you know, not investing in green assets or, or something of that nature. So, sorry, long answer, but it's, it's, it's really fundamentally about not reducing it to snapshot metrics, which I don't think capture the process of change. And it's often reduced to snapshot companies as well, and supply chains are often overlooked. So, for example, building a single 100 million watt wind farm requires 30,000 tonnes of iron ore, 50,000 tonnes of concrete and 900 tonnes of non-recyclable plastic. How do we look at ESG in a wider frame so it's not just picking out individual companies? Yeah, so I think a lot of this is about considering the purpose and consequences of what companies are doing. So in that particular instance, nobody has yet told me how we can build a wind farm without all of those materials that you just talked about. Now, part of the carbon transition is trying to find better, less polluting, less resource intensive ways of doing things. So that's part of it. But on the other hand, if a company, say a miner that digs up iron ore is absolutely crucial to producing the raw materials for those wind turbines, then... It really doesn't make sense to to simplistically say, well, we're not going to invest in in mining companies because they deplete the world's non-renewable resources, when they're in fact an absolutely crucial component of how we get to this more sustainable economy. I think the, the missing part in the conversation is very often trying to include the consequences of the activity that we see when 
in many cases, that's by far the most important thing. And Rio Tinto, which Bailey Gifford invests in, is a good example of that. Because there was a lot of controversy with Rio Tinto when they blew up the 46,000-year-old Aboriginal cave system. So how have we engaged with a company like Rio Tinto, for example? Do you know, I think that's a really interesting example because I think we met with Rio Tinto something like six times in the year after they got themselves into quite a difficult position. And, and again, to be clear, mistakes were definitely made. This is not a defence of what they did. But the far more useful conversation rather than condemnation is engage with management, find out if anything went wrong, indeed what went wrong, how they treat, in this case, heritage considerations. Are they treated with um, at senior levels within the organisation? Is there some sort of misalignment of incentives that means that they don't care about um, destroying cultural heritage, for example? Now, I don't think any of those things were true. I think what happened is, is there was, as can happen in large companies, as the situation developed, Rio's did not step back and reassess the work that they were doing in Australia um, when perhaps they should have done. We then discussed on several different occasions with everyone from the chairman on down about how do you put in place internal control mechanisms that better balance the interests of, you know, simplistically digging iron ore out the ground on the one hand and protecting the world's cultural heritage on the other hand. And they have now put in place much better internal mechanisms to make sure that they balance those I guess, conflicting goals much better. And then on top of that, you know, companies like Rio are trying very hard to be as responsible as they can be. So Rio has made tangible climate and carbon reduction commitments. They're aiming to be net carbon zero by 2050. They have 2030 milestones in place. Um, They've been at the forefront of various industry-wide initiatives around safe management of waste products, these types of things. So if we go back to the starting point that, Miners are necessary in the carbon transition. By the way, not all miners, you know, maybe something like thermal coal would be in a different place. But speaking here about iron ore in particular, the same argument would apply to other precious metals. You know, it's far better to understand these companies, talk to management and help them to do what they do in the best possible way. Because there still seems to be an element of, you know, sell bad stocks, buy good stocks. It doesn't seem to always be the most responsible course just to disinvest in the company easy but maybe not the right option absolutely that's the case in some cases i mean if a company is not best in class not committed to improving the let's call it the quality of the operations by which i just mean incorporating broad esg characteristics and not particularly engaged then I think at some point you do need some kind of milestones and you need an ultimate sanction is to not provide capital to that company. Even then, you do run into this sort of collaboration challenge, which is just because we eventually decide this company is not acting responsible and is not changing. Selling the shares doesn't necessarily achieve very much. It just shifts the problem to, I mean, it quite feasibly means that the buyer of the shares may well be somebody who cares less than we do about the responsible operating practices of an individual company. So if you go down that line, what have you achieved? You've very probably made things worse. Now, there's a gap here, I think, between the understanding of investors as to what responsible investing means and the reality of what responsible investing means. Now, to be very clear, there are very thoughtful, forward-thinking investors out there. And I wouldn't go so far as to say that you know, many people do understand that divestment is not really the most effective approach to tackling these very big challenges we have. But equally, I think there's a there's a very big communications exercise that the industry needs to undertake to help people to understand that. You know, we see regular examples of protesters who observe that, you know, a, a, a public sector pension scheme, for instance, invests in oil companies and simplistically you know, people walk around with banners and and fair, again, let's be fair about this. It's very well intentioned, but it doesn't really do anything at all to solve the problem. You know, what would you rather do if everybody feels compelled to sell out of, say, for example, oil companies and and their share prices are very negative as a result and somebody takes them private, for example? 
all you've done is you've changed the ownership structure. You haven't necessarily addressed any underlying problems. And what if, as may very well happen in the next 20 years, the oil majors are in actual fact a driving force behind the decarbonisation of the economy? I don't think we would really argue that that looks like it's happening at the moment, but I don't think we should rule it out forever. So maybe that's just an example of, you know, this really needs a lot of thought and a lot of consideration. And to just say, we don't want miners, we don't want oil, we don't want airlines, we don't want all sorts of other stuff. And, and you know, it doesn't get us very far. We've seen a big increase in ESG ratings, where ratings firms analyse whether a company meets various scores based on measurements such as human rights, emissions and governance. Are these ratings a helpful guide? There's a huge proliferation of indices out there now which purport to allow people to invest in ESG-led strategies which correspond to their own sense of importance in terms of, you know, what's the most important things we tackle. Again, it's, it's a bit, we're an active manager and, and in some ways we would bash the passive index managers, wouldn't we? That may, be, may or may not be the case, but I think there's a much more important point here, which is those metrics-based, measurement-based approaches to responsible investing don't capture the process of change adequately. And I do worry that, I mean, there's huge amounts of money flowing into passive ETF, ESG-type funds. I think there's a, a meaningful danger that because if you look at what's in some of those funds, not all of them, but many of them, for example, if you look at refinitive data, the top 30 highest ESG scores globally from memory, I think, include two tobacco companies in the top 10 names. Now, going back to the point of there are some companies that it's very hard to justify their existence at all, I think many ESG investors would be very surprised to learn that when they invest in, you know, whichever some S&P index that track that uses refinitive ESG ratings, that they would have two tobacco companies in the top 10 holdings, for example. I worry that people think they've solved the problem by investing in ESG-friendly strategies that have very simplistic approaches. And I would go so far as to say that might be worse than doing nothing, because if you think you've solved a problem, you'll stop paying attention to it. And what really matters here is environmental sustainability and just transition and social equity. That's what most people, I believe, think of when they're talking about ESG. If they think that they have invested in a strategy which is tackling these things when in actual fact it's not really tackling them because it's not capturing the process of change, I would argue that's almost worse than doing nothing. One of the things I'd like to emphasise though, Malcolm, is that I'm not suggesting here that ESG ratings are wrong in any way. Um, they, they, They may consider different issues and they may come up with different answers. There's nothing wrong with incorporating that into an investment process. My key point here is that You have to understand what it is that they're trying to tell you. I don't think it makes sense to simply translate that into some sort of passive fund in which you you line up the companies according to their ratings. And we have to use those inputs in a thoughtful way to help us get to a balanced judgment of what a company has to offer in the context of the ESG issues around that. It seems odd that a lot of these ESG ratings or scores don't really have much to do with the product or service that the company is actually operating in or selling? Yeah. Tesla, for example, I think scores more lowly on ESG considerations than Boeing, just to pick a couple of... Well, actually, it scores lower than General Motors as well, I think. So you just sort of look at that and think, well, what's in that bit of information? And what it does is it captures the existence of certain policies. So... You know, if you're a long-standing company and you've been under regulatory scrutiny for a period of time, you're going to have social policies, D&I policies, environmental policies, use of water policies, any number of things. And that will count very strongly for you in your overall ESG score, and rightly, because these companies are considering their impact on the world. If you take a company like Tesla, which is a younger company, somewhat more entrepreneurial, a bit less traditionally organized, shall we say, led by obviously a quirky leader and entrepreneur, the younger nature of that firm means it scores less highly on traditional sort of organisational ESG measures, if you like. 
But what that completely fails to take into account is that you know Tesla has almost undoubtedly done more to totally change the direction of the automobile industry into sometime in the now visible future to being overwhelmingly electric. But that's simply not captured anywhere. There can be very high carbon footprint companies that entirely justify their existence. There can be very low carbon footprint companies that are achieving much less in terms of contribution to society or contribution to a more sustainable world. But that just doesn't really figure in the in, in the numbers at all. Given there's no one size fits all solution, it's hard to quantify ESG. How do we measure progress? I, th- I, th- I think that's judgment. You know, how do you do it? You have to, I guess you look at what is a company producing? Who's buying it? What are they using it for? What's it displacing? How does it fit within a much broader ecosystem of moving towards a more sustainable approach? What impact does it have on social fairness? What impact does it have on the environment? These things are all judgments, particularly if, as we do, you focus on investing in growth companies when a lot of those positive societal contributions are likely to lie in the future as disruption and displacement happens across a wide range of industries. So, you know, one of the really big challenges we have on this is that it's almost immeasurable. It's far more important. Sort of forward-looking contribution to sustainability type of discussion is way more important than what's a company's carbon footprint this year. That's not to say the latter is unimportant, but, you know, that doesn't solve tomorrow's problems. The problem, the, the challenge there is how do you explain that to people? You can do it in, in a narrative way. We try and engage a lot with our clients about this is our thinking. It's particularly difficult and doesn't lend itself to some sort of ESG metrics scoring. You know, and that I think comes back to this educational part about, it's funny, this is a, at one level, it's a very complex subject. At another level, it's really quite straightforward. All we're saying is it's far more useful to focus on the companies that are enabling our sustainability transition by deploying capital into new and better ways of doing things than it is to simply focus on you know who happens to have a low carbon footprint at the moment and i would really encourage everyone to start thinking that way you know if we come back to our well your steel and concrete example we are not going to be able to do without steel and concrete in our carbon transition in the next 20 or 30 years and yet there is very little investment going into industries like that to find much less environmentally damaging approaches to the production of steel and concrete you know wouldn't it make a lot more sense to be investing in these industries rather than simply scoring them out using some sort of exclusion based approach which deprives those examples of the capital they need to actually create a cleaner environment it's a slightly reverse way of thinking and I would certainly encourage everybody to think a bit more carefully about the, you know, how do, how do you make things better if you ignore their existence? Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast, Stuart. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Um, always a pleasure and I hope that people find it interesting. You can find our podcast short briefings on long-term thinking at bailegifford.com forward slash podcasts or subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify or on TuneIn. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please spread the word. And if you'd like to read more about Stuart's thoughts about the rise of ESG, you can find his paper, Actual ESG, on our website at baileygifford.com forward slash insights. And many thanks to Lord of the Isles for the music. The track we've used is called Horizon Effect, which is released on permanent vacation. And if you're listening at home, if you're listening in the car, wherever you're listening, stay well. And we look forward to bringing you more insights in our next podcast. Mm-hmm.